All right, so real quick introduction. Um, want to get to the meat of this conversation, but my name is Bezad, um, and I'm going to talk to y'all today about how to do research that actually drives strategy. Um, I have had spent about the last 10 years, 10 plus years, in research in a number of different companies in different environments. I've had the privilege of working in consumer and enterprise organizations, working with everything from small two-person companies who don't know how to talk to customers, all the way up to large organizations like Figma, Facebook, Dropbox. Um, I started my career at Facebook about 10 years ago and was working mostly on ads and pages kind of products, so a lot of the business side of things. I spent tons of time going and actually visiting our small businesses, sitting in their offices, watching them work, um, doing a lot of kind of ethnographic work, and spent about four years there as Facebook went from three to 30,000 employees. So I watched all of our processes and systems break over and over again as we doubled every year for almost four years. I left Facebook and went and joined Slack as a researcher and then very quickly switched roles and took over research operations, which meant that half of my job was making sure that everyone on our research and data science teams had everything they need to do any of their work. And the other half of my job was making sure that everyone who wasn't in research or data science, but did something that looked like research or data science had all the support they needed to do their job. So that meant hosting interview trainings for people on the sales team, rolling out Qualtrics and survey software to our customer success teams, making sure that we were hosting office hours and other things for people who were, wanted to talk to customers and needed support or guidance, et cetera. Um, mid 2020 in the midst of a pandemic, which is the best time to walk away from a job, I left Slack and started yet another studio, um, which is my kind of independent consulting and advising practice where I work with a lot of companies to help them go from being kind of research curious to research competent. Um, I'm often helping people with their very first research project all the way through their first research hire. And I've had the chance to work with organizations like Figma and Dropbox and Replit and a bunch of small companies that you probably haven't heard of. And at the same time, I started working with Reforge to build out um, a number of courses. So I've had the privilege of building three courses with Reforge, two of which are currently running. The first one was the User Insights for Product Decisions program, and that ran for two and a half years, and I've had the privilege of having over a thousand people go through this. We go from everything from decision-first planning through a deep dive on a bunch of methods to how to synthesize and share your work. Um, and that's currently an on-demand course if you are a Reforge member. And this past fall, I built Effective Customer Conversations, which was my first chance to kind of remix and rebuild and iterate on the user insights program, but with a really deep focus on customer conversations. So the biggest request from the people who've come through the user insights program was, I want to better understand how to talk to customers. I want more practice. I want more tips and help there. And so I built an entire experience around that that includes practice activities and sessions as a part of a live program. Um, and that starts next week, and there's still room for sign up. So if you're interested, please let us know. You can drop stuff in chat, and Chris is happy to help orient you all. But for the next 30-ish minutes, I want to talk about uh, three things, and then we'll have some time for Q&A. I want to talk about decision-first research. I want to share some case studies with you from my time at Facebook and Slack. And then I want to help you apply this to your own work. All right. And then we will have, I'm trying to keep about 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, as we are going through, I would love for you to drop questions into the Q&A function. Um, so if you pop in Zoom, there's both chat and Q&A definitely put the questions in Q&A and we're going to encourage you to upvote things that you are interested in. I will periodically pause through this presentation and take a look at the questions, make sure that there's anything that people are asking that's clarifying. I spent some time addressing that before we move forward. All right, let's get started. So <clears throat> a lot of people I talk to, both researchers and non-researchers, tell me that good research is about learning. And I think that that's half true, but I also think that it's the less important half of that sentence. Because I think that good research is really learning in service of making decisions. You're learning so that you can do something, so that you can take some kind of action. And the mistake that most people make is they focus just on learning itself, rather than the reason that you're trying to learn a thing. And I know this feels like a pretty small and semantic difference, but I want to walk through how this plays out, because this is a mistake that I've seen hundreds of people make in my career, and it's resulted in bad product shipping, wasted customer time, and tons of bloated research teams. So let's imagine we're a small startup and we're seeing customers churn and we wanna figure out why that's happening. You could imagine that we could talk to some users who aren't happy and figure out what's going on there, right? 
And so deciding to interview these customers will help us gather some kind of evidence. And that may or may not help us make any decisions about what to do about trade. But this is what most people do. They pick a research approach that they know, they try to gather some evidence, and they hope that it ultimately helps them do something, like make a decision. But this is misguided, if not wasteful. And this is what I can refer to as decision last research, because the decision you're making is literally the last thing you are thinking about. And there tends to be at least three different problems with this approach. The first problem is that you can choose the wrong research methods, right? Many people I talk to pick research methods out of convenience rather than conviction. They know how to talk to customers or do an interview, and they think that means that they need to go talk to five people. Or they think that they can send a survey out without thinking about their population or statistical significance or any sort of sampling strategy. Now, even if you were to pick the right approach, let's say interviews was the best way forward, it's very possible that you gather the wrong data, either as a result of choosing the wrong people to engage with or the wrong questions to ask. So you run the risk of gathering data that doesn't actually help you make your decision, which is both a waste of your time and resources and a waste of your customer's time and resources, right? This is bad input, which is gonna to lead to a bad output. And the third big problem that I often run into is that people don't involve the right stakeholders, right? Any decision you make, any action in your organization requires buy-in or approval from probably your boss, if not some group of people. And without any clarity on how they are making that decision, you're not gonna know that you're gathering the right evidence to actually drive things forward. And you also probably end up spending a lot more time communicating a lot of the, the value of the insights that you've learned to help convince people when that's not the basis for how they'd be making that decision in the first place. So if this is what people normally do and they work kind of approach evidence decision, what's the better way to do this? To no one's surprise, it would be work backwards, right? Literally be decision first when you're doing this research. Doing this and starting with the decision forces clarity about the boundaries of the decision that you are making. You have to talk about what's possible or not possible, about what you're willing or not willing to do. And you have that conversation up front before you've spent customer time on anything. And once you have clarity on the decision you're trying to make, you can focus your attention on the evidence that you need to make that decision. And I've talked about this in other places, but this step is sort of like playing Wheel of Fortune and agreeing at what point you're ready to solve the puzzle. So in some cases, many of you feel okay solving from here, right? But if you don't, you have to have the cost, the conversation about the cost and benefit of getting more letters on the board. Except in the world of building products, each letter is like the result of an experiment or a customer conversation, et cetera, that gives you more confidence in the decision that you are making. And so when you're clear about this, you can be very, you are more aligned across your team about what the decision is that we're making and what we need to feel confident moving forward and what our threshold is for that confidence. So you can say, hey, we need to hear this from this group of people, or we want to see this from this other group of people so that we know we are going to be making the right decision or at least okay with it. And from there, you can actually scope research to go and gather that missing evidence. So you're no longer dealing with the wrong data, the wrong approach, the wrong data, or the not involving the right stakeholders. So if we go back to that churn example, if our initial approach was to ask something like, hey, why are people churning? A more sophisticated or a decision first approach would actually be saying something like, what is it that we should prioritize that will improve retention with our target audience? This is very bounded because it's a question of what are the things that we should do of the things that we can to drive an outcome that matters to the business for an audience that we care about. And now we know who we're focusing on, how we want to engage with them, and so on. So while well, I hope this part has been obvious, I want to call out two other benefits of doing this kind of approach. The first is that lots of things feel like they are worth learning, even if they aren't. It's easy, I bet if I asked you right now, you could list dozens of things that you could learn about your customers, about the market, about the industry, that feel like they would be helpful to you. But then if I asked you to think about what are the big decisions that your company is making, I bet you that list would be much smaller and much easier to prioritize, right? And so one of the questions that I ask a lot of the clients I work with when they're trying to figure out what research I should do is if you could increase your confidence or reduce the risk of two to three things that you're doing on your roadmap, whether that's next quarter, next half, or next year, what would they be? 
And this is a great way to force the conversation that I was just talking about, because you can take a look at each initiative and what it represents and recognize that everything on your roadmap is an investment or a bet of some sort. Some of those are less risky than others, but the ones that are high risk and high value become very easy for you to prioritize. <laughs> the second benefit here is that it makes it much easier to ask three questions that you should always be asking about your research, which is, is this feasible to do? Is this reasonable to do? And is this worthwhile to do? So I've had some startup CEOs that come to me and say, hey, I'm working on a technical project and I want to send a survey to all the CTOs at Fortune 500 companies. That's not feasible. Those people do not answer surveys, right? So we can then have a conversation about what are other approaches that may make sense and kind of work through this. I've also had people I work with who want to ship a 100 question survey. And that in my mind is not very reasonable unless you're paying people a lot of money for their time. And the third part is maybe the most important, especially when you think about the decisions you're making, because all research has a cost. It costs you time and energy to plan and conduct. It costs your team time to engage with, it costs the customers time. And so thinking about what this decision is, what is the outcome, what is the action that we can take, makes it much easier for you to think about the ROI of doing this kind of work, which is much harder to do when you're saying, oh, we're going to go learn some things and hope that they move us forward, et cetera. All right. Um, I see there's one question in the chat. I'm actually going to answer it later in the presentation. So um, I'm going to keep rolling here. All right. I want to share some case studies with y'all. And the first one is from my time at Slack. So <clears throat> this is a much deeper example of why focusing on decisions and not just learning is a better way to do research. And I want to tell you about work I did while I was at Slack back in 2018 to help understand what it was that we should be doing in India. And I'm going to compare how this looks in kind of a decision last and decision first world, especially as it relates to planning, executing, and sharing that work. And while I'm going to be talking about going into a new market, you could imagine this story is very similar where India is a new geography, a new customer segment, or a new opportunity that you're going after. So... Let's imagine for a second that you work at Slack and you're growing your customer. You know that growing the customer base in India is a strategic opportunity. It's 2018. You have some people using the product, but you have no actual business footprint in India. You don't really understand what people like or don't like about Slack. You don't know what's driving retention, et cetera. So it's possible that you look at the situation and you say, hey, we should do a survey and interview some people and see how they feel about things. And that's not totally wrong. But again, this is very much a methods first approach. It's a decision last approach, right? You're not thinking about well, what's the actual decisions here. And so I knew that we wanted to better understand what was going on in India, but I knew that there were a lot of different teams that probably cared about this. So I went to my product partners and I asked them what was possible. What was the scope of the decision space for them? It was clear that our primary decision as a company was how do we drive acquisition and retention in India? But that leaves a lot of white space in terms of what was possible. What customers do we care about? Were there certain kind of businesses or industries? What were the things that we were or will, weren't willing to do? So I heard things like our finance team was trying to decide whether or not we should discount our prices. The infrastructure team was trying to decide whether or not we needed to build an offline experience to compete with things like WhatsApp. The core product team was curious about where we could remove unnecessary friction in the onboarding process. Our platform team was trying to decide what are the apps and integrations in the market that were unique to India that we needed to pursue, if any. The marketing team was interested in how do, can we better communicate the value of Slack and tell the Slack story in this market. And our sales team was really interested in understanding how do we better build a go-to-market and sales motion for multinational companies that have a large population in India. And I'm not trying to kitchen sink this. I know this looks like a pretty strong contrast, but I'm trying to highlight how doing this work up front ensures that I'm spending my time, my colleagues' time, and my customers' time on something that actually matters and is going to move the business forward. So again, you can imagine that we have kind of this, this juxtaposition of like, okay, how do people in India feel about Slack? Let's like interview people, send a survey versus this long list of questions that we have here. So in the decision last world, you're probably doing a survey and some interviews. But in our decision first world, what we realized was we actually needed to talk to three different business types. We needed to talk to small businesses that were already using Slack, large organizations that were using Slack, and then potential customers to understand what their tools and workflows looked like. And so we set up nine customer visits so that we could talk to three different customers, three different businesses from each type. 
And then we set up focus groups with four key customer segments. We talked to software decision makers. We talked to people who were Slack admins. We talked to uh, people who were developing on Slack. And then we talked to end users. And if you're thinking, wow, this sounds like a lot of work. You must have been in India for a really long time. Um, I'm here to tell you that I, I'm actually a masochist. and I'm not the kind of person you want to go on a research trip with because we did all of this over the course of five days. So every day when we were in Bangalore, we would basically pick a customer who was far away from our hotel and we would drive out there in the morning. We would have a conversation with them. And then we would meet with a customer who was between that customer and us on the way home. And then every night we had a focus group for the first four nights. And in each of these visits, I split the team up. And so I, along with someone else, would often interview a software decision maker or a leader about the organization and how they use Slack. And then the rest of the team that I had on the ground with me would go and sit side by side with customers and actually look at their Slack workspace and understand what was happening, what was working, how did they name their channels, what was going on there, et cetera. But that wasn't all. Um, at the beginning of every day, we would have kind of a pre-brief. So I would help set expectations for who we were talking to. I would sit down and we would go through the plan of the questions we were gonna ask, et cetera. And then after each of these meetings, we debriefed. We talked about what were the things that we heard? What were the questions that we asked that we thought were helpful? Or how could we ask those questions better? Did we need to change our approach, et cetera? Um, <clears throat> and these debriefs were a really important part of making sure that we weren't just learning things. We were learning things that would actually help our colleagues make decisions. For those of you who've done a lot of qualitative research, especially in a foreign country, you know how much the things you plan may or may not work in reality and how full your head gets after each of these visits. So it was important for us to like get out and write these things down. And the other thing we did was after each of these debriefs, we shared stuff back with people in headquarters. And this was really about saying, hey, you came to us and said, you're trying to make these decisions. We thought that this was the kind of evidence you needed. Are we gathering things that are helpful or do we actually need to start iterating on how we do this? Um, and if you think back to that Wheel of Fortune metaphor I shared earlier, this was a matter of like, are we filling out more letters on the board, right? Are we getting closer to a place that we can make these decisions confidently? Um, and so again, in this decision last world, you've done the survey, you've done the interviews. If you're lucky, you probably are putting together some sort of key findings deck, and then you're maybe doing some team specific call outs if you can. We ended up doing those daily dispatches from the field, like you saw in green. When we got back, I was part of a company, All Hands, sharing a lot of the high level things we've learned as sort of a, hey, here was kind of a summary of things and we're gonna do a bunch more follow-ups. Here's how to think about kind of key themes. We had 14 team specific meetings to share a lot of the decisions and evidence with folks. And then we also made some videos, highlight reels and did a bunch of other stuff. So a small sampling of the things that we learned from the trip, just so I can connect it to some of the decisions was there was this idea of Jugad, which is kind of this spirit of resourcefulness that we saw in every organization. So we, we talked with one company who they took all of the most important things that were said in Slack and they put it in Google Drive. And this was because Slack was too expensive to pay for. So they kept losing message history. And that meant that like Slack couldn't be the place that they learned they had all their most important messages, right? Um, this was really hard for us because then it meant Slack was less of a valuable product and it was mostly more like chat and then it was competing with WhatsApp and we were going to lose against WhatsApp on kind of every dimension. We also learned that for a lot of companies, Slack was the highest, second highest expense after infrastructure. So their AWS or Azure bill and then Slack, which is kind of wild if you think about some of your bills at your companies. Um, and then we also learned that there were a lot of bandwidth and intermittent connectivity constraints, which meant using Slack was pretty difficult um, on people's commutes. So some of the things that we decided to do as a result of this work was we discounted Slack by like 40 to 60% so that we could more effectively acquire, retain, and monetize the products. We decided we were never going to win against WhatsApp on that dimension. And so instead of building an offline experience, we worked on improving caching and making it so that you could engage with messages and load it in a different way that people had more regular access to Slack. And we had a lot more clarity about the kinds of businesses that we could or couldn't go after given local rules on data protections, privacy, and other things like that. Awesome, just popping in to um, some, some clarifying questions here. Um, Alessandro asked, being in India is a very different professional culture compared to the US. Did you involve a local researcher? Yes, we had um, a local research team that helped us, actually, they actually ran the focus groups. So we drafted the questions, they administered them. Um, we also had a local guide who was really helpful in us thinking about the different companies that we selected. 
um, and the way that we engaged with them, any sort of rituals or customs we needed to be conscious about, things like how we greeted people, how we spent time, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that is um, a great question. Um, there's some good questions in here that I would encourage y'all to vote up. Um, and I will follow up some more soon. Um, all right, last case study before I can try to wrap things up. So one more story for y'all this time at Facebook, and this is even earlier in history, but it's a fun one. So um, rewind the clock back a bit. It's 2014. Facebook looked more or less like this, but there was one big difference, which was we used to render YouTube videos in feed. Um, occasionally we played our own, but most people were not uploading a lot of video to Facebook, which seems bananas given that it's 2023 and Instagram and Facebook are basically just video now. Video at the time was picking up importance and it and we saw that there was a lot of increasing in uploads, but not just from end users, also from people like celebrities, brands, et cetera, which we knew were really important. We had just transitioned to being kind of a mobile first company. We launched the first version of Pages Mobile, which I got to work on. Um, so video and rich media was something we were starting to scratch the surface of, especially as we just um, acquired Oculus. And so some of the big decisions we were trying to make as an organization were how should we support video on Facebook? What are the kinds of controls we needed to build to enable the people to upload and manage those videos effectively? And what kinds of reporting and analytics did we need to build both for kind of the average person and for large organizations? And the one thing I'll point out is at the time, I, don't, I imagine many of you don't remember this, videos lived within a post. So if you tried to like find a link to a video, it was actually the post itself. There was like post copy and the video and they were all tied together. And this led to tons of different problems, um, which I don't have time to talk about here, but it was something that we knew probably needed to be revisited. And so some of the things we wanted to get evidence on was what does it look like for a successful video to be on Facebook from the perspective of a creator? And what is kind of the process for managing that? What are the steps that they take? What are the different tools that they're using, et cetera? What are all the things that we can't see on the platform? And then what's the data that people want about video and its viewers that they consider most critical for them to make any of the adjustments they need? And so what we ended up doing was starting way at a high end scale of talking to video creators and movie studios about their workflows and success criteria. Because we thought if we can start to solve some of the biggest, meatiest problems for people who are dealing with hundreds, if not thousands of videos, we can probably figure out how to scale that experience down to the average person. And these interviews included a card sorting exercise to better understand the metrics, which I'll talk about in part of the story. And so we spent time with about a dozen teams, including people like Sony, Universal, um, Beyonce's managers, The Ellen Show, ESPN, et cetera. Um, and we interviewed, thankfully, at all of them, a handful of roles, often at the same time, people from like the head of digital all the way down to YouTube community managers. And it was important for us to start with these people because they lived and breathed video. And so we, we felt really confident that if we could have them be successful on the platform, including some of the things that they deal with, with copyright and music and other stuff that needs to be respected, we could probably do this for the average person. And in almost all of these conversations, the entire time was spent anchored around one kind of question, which was walk us through what your ideal video launch looks like. Um, you know, obviously you start off and you build rapport, you warm up, you get some context in them in the business, which at this scale, we often got from the sales team, um, but we'd anchor around a provocation like this. And it was a great question because it wasn't about Facebook, which we knew about on our own. It was asking them about their experience and their perspective, which gave us tons of surface area to dig into. We could ask why they wanted things to be like that or how they did certain things. We could play naive because I've never worked in a movie studio. And so when we went to Universal, they actually talked us through how they wanted to launch the first Fifty Shades of Grey movie, which was about at that time. Um, they talked about how they wanted to control the different video assets, how they wanted to grant permission to different pages, the different kind of data that they wanted back and how they were going to use it, et cetera. Um, and it ended up being a really helpful way for us to understand what the journey looked like for them as a video. And this happened with basically every company we talked to, especially folks like Nike, who have thousands of digital assets and are always kind of sh sharing those kind of things. And so across all of that, some of the things that we learned was that for these organizations, video was basically their most important asset. And Facebook at the time had some of the best distribution. So they really wanted to figure out how to make this work. And they were willing to continue working with us, which is always a good outcome of doing any kind of customer engagement. We also learned that managing video is incredibly complicated and that most of these companies had dedicated tools just for managing video. And there was no way that Facebook was going to be able to build all of the complexity that we wanted. But our takeaway was that we actually did need to treat video like a first class citizen and build a much more robust content management system to make that work. 
And so what we spent the next, honestly, year doing from an engineering perspective was breaking this container model. So in the old world on the left, we had video living within a post itself. And what we realized was that every post needed to become a container where you could put assets in. You could put in a set of photos, you could put in a video, you could put in a set of videos, you could put in a carousel, et cetera. But the videos themselves needed to be treated like first-class citizens on Facebook, and we needed to be able to move them around, grant them permissions, et cetera. Um, and this, this really laid the foundation for a lot of what Facebook and Instagram are able to do today, whether you think that's good or bad. Um, but it was a really helpful Thing because if we had started with what are people doing with video, we never would have gotten to this clear understanding of, okay, if we want to help support creators managing all of their videos, <clears throat> this decision space probably would not have even been at the same scale, right? And so it's wild that we ended up doing a dozen plus customer interviews and then ended up spending a year plus of engineering time basically ripping video out from a lot of our existing content or um, infrastructure. All right, I'm gonna take one more pass at this and try to get through the next section in five minutes so that we can go through all these questions. And there are a lot of good ones, so please, please, please keep upvoting. Awesome. Okay, so I wanna finish off by talking about how to put this into practice. And I'm um, hopefully you're already bought in on this idea. And if not, you know, we can talk about this on Twitter or LinkedIn or something afterwards. Um, I work with a lot of people who are still too focused on learning. And the first step in transitioning out of that mindset is shifting from working forwards to working backwards. A lot of people who are saying, oh, like, what could we learn? How could this help, right? But I want to encourage you to go back to this question I asked earlier and something similar, right? If we look at the roadmap and we can increase our confidence or reduce the risk of some set of things on there, what are the things that we would actually work on? I see too many teams get to projects in a roadmap and realize there's not enough time to do research for the most important decisions the company is trying to make. And if you become a part of the planning process and start asking as soon as you get a roadmap, what of these things are the highest leverage for the business, it's much easier for you to be focused on doing the right research. The other thing that I would encourage you to do if you're really focused on learning is, or if you have colleagues especially who are really focused on learning, is ask why they want to learn this. Or better yet, assuming you were going to learn this, what would you do about it, right? Um, if you're a researcher, this can help you prioritize incoming research requests. And if you're a product manager or designer who's doing that research, you can use this to push your own thinking. So let's think about how this actually plays out, right? Earlier, we talked about the shift from why are people churning to how should we prioritize, what should we prioritize to improve retention with our target audience? Um, someone in the comments meant, hey, or someone in the questions asked, surely we'd have some sort of insights on why users are churning. I'd like to think that you have some data about people's usage behaviors and the fact that they churned. You probably have some set of hypotheses, right? But very often what happens is people are like, hey, I want to learn why are people churning? And I'm like, great, why? Seems like a silly question. But the reality is they say, okay, well, I want to figure out why customers are unsatisfied. I'm like, and then what are you going to do, right? And then they're like, well, I want to address the source of their dissatisfaction. I'm like, do you want to do this for every customer? Do you actually care about all churn? And it's like, no, no, no. I care only about the right customer. I'm like, okay, well, do you actually care about stopping them from churning or do you care about deepening their engagement and making sure that they're getting value out of the product? It's like, oh, well, yeah, I care about delivering more value. I'm like, okay, so what you're actually asking is what are the things that we do that drive retention? It's not about stopping churn. It's about driving retention. And I know that this, again, feels like a very small semantic difference, but it changes the way that you do the research. Because if you're just trying to understand why people are churning, you go talk to anyone who's churning. If you're trying to understand how do you drive retention for your target audience, you're talking to a much smaller group of people and you're having a much more focused conversation. And the last thing I'll say here is build this kind of work into your project plans. So one of the things that I encourage a lot of people I work with to do in their project plans is have sections on like, hey, what are the goals and decisions of this work? Why are we doing this? What decision are we trying to make? What evidence do we need to do this really well, right? Call out your stakeholders. Who's actually invested in the outcome of this work? And have they agreed that like, if you go and gather this evidence, you will be more confident in moving this decision forward. I worked with a lot of people who stumble here and they go and gather things that we already kind of know or don't feel like the things that are actually gonna change our mind. And then please, 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 please call out what you already know. This ends up being a really rich space for people from different roles to dump in and point at different data, highlight different things that you know maybe are not visible to each of you. But together, it's much easier to say, hey, here's kind of the surface area. Again, you're putting letters up on the board and saying, hey, what are the couple that we are missing? Um, and the last thing, just to plug the class again, um, 
if any of this was interesting to you, uh, the new version, the next version of Effective Customer Conversations starts on Monday. It's a two-week-long course. There are two 60-minute sessions, Tuesday, Thursday morning from 9 to 10 a.m. Pacific. The first week is all about planning good conversations. The second week is all about being in the room and the skills you need to actually like listen, probe, ask follow-up questions and make sense of it. And then we have the Thursday sessions each week dedicated just to practice exercises and breakout rooms so that you can build your confidence and competence in doing that. And now we have about 12 minutes for Q&A. So take 30 seconds, go read the questions that have been asked, upvote the things that are most interesting to you, and then Chris and I will work through them. And I'll stop sharing to make life a little easier. Is that, do you still want to address the first question uh, from Charlie? Um, you kind of touched on that yeah. a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Charlie's question is, uh, on related to churn, surely we have some insights into why users are churning before we want to start to consider ideas potential bets. Totally. I, I would assume that there's always going to be data in that organization, right? You have people who are probably the wrong fit, people who are not using the product enough, people who you know aren't getting enough value. <clears throat> but my push to you would be, is it more helpful to understand how true each of those things are or to focus on what is the thing that is going to help you as a business move forward, which is acquiring the right customers, activating them, deepening their engagement, retaining them and figuring out how to monetize. And like, there are going to be plenty of things that you could learn about why people churn or what's causing that churn. And you will learn those things on the way, but the focus on, Hey, let's go figure out why people are churning or which of the things that we think lead to churn actually lead to churn is much less effective from saying, how do we drive retention for the people that we care about that are going to sustain the business? Um, Benicia asked a question. I hope I'm saying your name right. I'm sorry. Um, do you or how might you help the product owners ask the right questions or the right decisions to be made? This is a great question. Um, I really like Annie Duke's framework on thinking in bets. And so I really believe that everything on your roadmap is a bet. Like you think that, and it's a hypothesis, right? We think we're going to launch this feature. It's going to drive this outcome, which hopefully ladders up to better business outcomes. And so one of the things that I try to work backwards from is when people come to me with a request, I do sort of do that, you know, in a very kind way of like, okay, why do you want to know this? Or how does this help us? And usually it, it takes a little bit of that back and forth, but we get to, well, we're trying to decide whether we should build feature A or if you should be. I'm like, okay, what is it that we think building those features is going to do? Oh, we're trying to, you know, drive growth or we're trying to reduce friction or we're trying to make customers happy. Whatever. Great. Okay. So the decision you're making is, do we think that like, or will feature A or feature B drive this outcome? Great. Okay. Now that we have clarity on at least like that, how would you evaluate whether those things are true? Well, I want to hear that customers like feature A more than feature B, or I want to see that feature A has shorter time usage than feature B, whatever that is, right? And I think that that process both invites them into your practice as a researcher, but it also makes it much easier for you to start to scope the project and evaluate whether this, like how you're going to do this and whether that again is like feasible and reasonable and worthwhile. Because if people say that they want to hear something from someone, but they don't realize what they actually want is to like observe customers doing a thing, you went from like an interview to maybe a diary study or, you know, a beta test or a customer pilot. And those obviously, as you know, have much different timeframes, much different investments. And I think the, the whole help of like nudging them away from, I want to learn this or see this to like what that actually drives opens up that space so you can have a richer conversation. Um, have you had any experience with the decision first approach for smaller products pre-product market fit? Yes. Um, pre-product market fit is a fun space to be in, mostly because I think the thing that a lot of people do wrong is they have too much of their product lens on it. So before you have product market fit, one of the most important things that you need to have clarity on is what are the problem, like what problems do, what problem do I really want to solve? And I think that the, the hardest part of that question is, is this problem worth solving? Because a lot of us can find lots of problems in the world that we think we want to solve. But is this problem worth solving is really a question of, can I build a sustainable business by offering a solution to a group of people who have this problem? And I think, you know, before you get into any product oriented decisions, 
the real decision framework that you're trying to make is, is this problem big enough for me to build a business off of? And that is about who are the people that have this problem? How do they solve this problem today? What has or hasn't worked? How much does it actually impact them? Are they willing to spend money on this? And so on. And I've had success in orienting people away from the like, oh, well, will this, will people buy this to, is there actually a market here? And then do we, like, what do we need to do to address that problem successfully? <clears throat> um, Catherine asked, if you're constrained for time and resources, what are principles used to get 80% of the answers confidently and quickly? Narrow scope to, ooh. Um, this one's probably hard to answer in the abstract. Um, but I would say that like when I feel constrained for time, what I'm often trying to do is get a set of, ex I'm trying to basically update my intuition or get more examples. And so if I can only talk to a handful of customers, I want to pick different kinds of customers and understand the world from their perspective or understand their behaviors so that I can then go and use any other data that I have to try and triangulate or harmonize against those things. Um, I also think that a lot of times we try to make all customers happy rather than the customers that are like having any sort of prioritization across our customers or thinking about any sort of dependencies, right? Like the video example is a good one of if we can help Universal launch 50 Shades of Grey, I bet we can help the mom and pop ice cream shop post their flavor of the day video. And so it was really easy for us to prioritize because one had just a, operated at a very different scale. Um, how do you do research when you are money or resource constrained? That's why companies do long surveys because it's cheaper and at least you see you see what tickets to the wall versus traveling internationally. Yeah, I, I would say that um, compared to when I started and I used to have to transcribe things myself, um, research has gotten a lot faster and more efficient. Um, but I think that the questions that I asked earlier, like, you know, is this feasible or reasonable or worthwhile? Like my first question with any research is like, is this really worth doing? And those are, those are helpful questions to ask. Um, I think if you're constrained, I would focus on either fewer, either doing fewer things well, or understanding if you are going to be less confident moving forward, what are the areas that are two-way doors, right? Where can you either hedge a little bit or if something goes wrong, you can roll it back. Certain businesses, this is or isn't, you know, this is more or less relevant. If you work in health or financial services, it's much harder to roll things back. You could actually harm your participants. So you want to be much more careful about that. If you're building, you know, maybe a drawing application for iPad, like you can probably make some changes and people aren't super bothered. Um, but I would say that between you know, new AI tools, which are helping speed up some of these things or being much more intentional about the one to two people who you're actually going to engage with. I think there's definitely ways you can scope down. Um, it's about really being clear how generalizable or scalable that data is, what it represents and like where you can go using other data sources to kind of triangulate from there. Um, Super resource. Okay, this is a long question. Try to map. Um, uh, if you send this to me over DM, we can maybe have a conversation. It's too long to answer uh, in in person here. Um, any insights on how to shift the culture to taking more appropriate time to research upfront versus rushing to solution ineffectively? Who? Um. I'm a big fan of postmortems. And um, this is something that we do a lot at Reforge. It was something we did a lot at Slack and at Facebook. But when uh, after launches, sitting down and saying, okay, what went well? How did it go compared to our expect like our expectations? If we wanted it to have gone better, what could we have known beforehand? What trade-offs did we make? What are some of those tensions? And instead of using it as a way to point fingers and say, oh, you didn't do your job or you didn't do your job, trying to highlight the actual impact to the customer and the business. And what are the things that you could be doing next time to help do that? Um, one of the things I see from researchers a lot is they try to talk, they try to be in every customer conversation. They try to touch every product. I think it is much more effective for you to do a few things well and help people understand what research can actually do to drive outcomes than to try to be everywhere all the time. Um, but I think if you are feeling like people are not giving you the right time, I would think about again, Hey, Hey, how can you scale a little bit? This, how do you scale things down? Is it, can I talk to one to two customers to just make sure that the data that we have actually represents people's real behaviors or like start to poke and prod 
Or do you just pick your battle and say, hey, this is the one thing I'm really going to work on because I think that this is helpful. But I also, I, I would encourage you to lean into postmortems because any of those kind of reflections, especially as a group, becomes really valuable. Um, yeah, Ilya, great question. Is there a difference between a decision first approach and a how might we? Totally. Uh, I think that how might we is very... Um, Divergent. This is what are all the possibilities of things that we can do? And very often you could ask that question as almost a free work to the decision framework if you if you want. Um, but I would imagine that you don't actually have to think that hard about what are the possible things that you're willing to do. And I think the problem that most people go down when they use like a how might we is then they interrogate every one of those options. Like, okay, well, if we want to do this, but like, and they don't think through, if we did this, would this impact the business? Would this benefit the customer? Would this, et cetera? They just evaluate those options themselves. And so a big part of the decision first framework is what are the actual decisions that we are trying to make as a business to succeed as a business? And how do we get evidence to know which of those things we should do? So I understand how that can feel very semantic. Um, but I think that the way that they get leverage is often very different because people are just like, oh, how might we do this list of a hundred things? And I'm like, you're not actually going to do most of those things. And investing a lot of time, especially in the environment that we're in right now, where people are very resource constrained, where companies are very lean, it can be helpful for you to go broad and to think about that. As long as you're willing to call that list down and then say, what's the evidence that we could get to evaluate which of the set of these things we might do or should do is actually worth doing. Um, Jamaica asked about discounting Slack. Um, we just realized that Slack was like, uh, far too expensive relative to other tools in the market. And it was, you know, if people's choice was paying for Slack for their company or hiring more engineers, they were very often hiring more engineers. And so we realized that we needed to be better about localizing our pricing. Probably have time for one more, Bezad. Awesome. Um, Brittany asked, how does this approach differ in a zero to one space if at all? Um, definitely differs in zero to one a bit because you're very often trying to figure out whether something, you know, it's kind of like the pre PMF question, like, is this worth doing? And a lot of the decisions are, you know, how do we know that we are, you know, the question there is, how do we know we should continue to go forward? Right? Like, what are the signs that we're looking for that this is working? And so a lot of zero to one decisions are like, is this a problem we're solving? Is it like, who are the right people to go after to solve this problem? How do we know that we are solving this problem? Well, and being really clear about the focusing on the right data um, because you're operating in typically like a pretty data starved environment when you're building something from scratch. Um, thank you all for joining. I know a bunch of you have had to drop and 230 of you are still here. So thank you. Um, feel free to reach out. Uh, my contact information is all over the internet. I would love to hear from you and hope to see many of you in the course either in December or moving forward. <laughs>